<laughs> 38 persons killed, 357 injured, about and about 1,000 rendered homeless and destitute was the casualty list of the race riot which broke out in Chicago on July 27, 1919 and swept uncontrolled through parts of the city for four days. By August 2nd, it had yielded to the forces of law and order and on August 8th, the state militia withdrew. A clash between whites and Negroes on the shore of Lake Michigan at 29th Street, which involved much stone throwing and resulted in the drowning of a Negro boy, was the beginning of the riot. A policeman's refusal to arrest the white man accused by Negroes of stoning the Negro boy was an important factor in starting the mob action. Within two hours, um, Within two hours, the riot was in full sway and had scored its second fatality and was spreading throughout the south and southwest parts of the city. Before the end came, it reached out to the section of the west side and even invaded the loop, the heart of Chicago's downtown district, business district. Of the 38 killed, 15 were white and 23 Negroes. Of the 537 injured, 178 white were white and 342 were Negroes. And the race of 17 was not recorded. In contrast with many other outbreaks of violence over racial friction, the Chicago riot was not preceded by excitement over reports of attacks on women or of any other crimes alleged to have been committed by Negroes. It is interesting to note that not one of the 38 deaths was of a woman or girl and that only 10 of the 537 persons injured were women or girls. Wait a minute, say it again. It is interesting to note that not one of the 38 deaths was of a woman or girl and that only 10 of the 537 persons injured were women and girls. Okay. In further contrast with other outbreaks of racial violence, the Chicago riot was marked by no hangings or burnings. The rioting was characterized by much activity on the parts of gangs, of hoodlums, and the clashes developed from sudden and spontaneous assaults into organized raids against life and property. The handling, in handling the emergency and restoring order, the police were effectively reinforced by the state militia. Help was also rendered by deputy sheriffs and by ex-soldiers who had volunteered. In nine of the 38 cases of death, indictments for murder were voted by the grand jury. And in the ensuing trials, there were four convictions. In 15 other cases, the coroner's jury recommended that unknown members of mobs be apprehended, but none of these was ever found. The conditions underlying the Chicago riot are discussed in detail in other sections of this report, especially in those which deal with the housing industry and racial contracts. I mean, racial contacts. The commission's inquiry concerning the facts of the riot included a critical analysis of the 5,584 pages of the testimony taken by a coroner's jury, a study of records of the police of the state's attorney, studies of the records by the police department, hospitals, and other institutions with referred to uh, with reference to injuries, and the records of five departments with reference to incendiary fires. The interviews with many public officials and citizens have a special knowledge of various phases of the riot. 
Much information was also gained by the commission in a series of four conferences to which it invited the foreman of the riot grand jury, the chief and other commanding officers in the police department, the state's attorney, and some of his assistants and officers in command of the state militia during the riot. State militia. That's what that little dude in Kenosha was. Huh? He was part of a state back militia. Cause see, this is where they got it written into their rules that when they decide to change their mind, I mean, when when the shit get a little heat, they'll just deputize deputize a bunch of Neanderthals, and um, it's all good. So remember, you paying taxes for these police departments to to get you one way or the other. It's just insane how they got this stuff sold up. Nevertheless, let me finish. Background of the riot. The Chicago riot was not only the only serious outbreak break of interracial violence in the year that was that followed the war. The same number of witnesses in the riot in Washington about a week later. Of uh, the riot in Omaha about a month later. And then the week of armed conflict in a rural district of Arkansas due to the exploitation of Negro cotton producers. Nor Chicago riot the first violent, nor was Chicago riot the first violent manifestation of race antagonism in Illinois. In 1908, Springfield had been the scene of an outbreak that brought shame to the community, which boasted of having been Lincoln's home. In the 1970, East St. Louis was torn by bitter and destructive riot. Oh, yeah, I told you about the East St. Louis massacre. Um, anyway, let me go ahead. Um, uh, 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 through a, a thorough study, Springfield and East St. Louis riots and the minor clashes in Chicago occurring both before and after the riot of 1919. Chicago was one of the northern cities mostly largely affected by the migration of Negroes from the South during the war. The Negro population increased from 44,103 in 1910 to 109,594 in 1920, an increase of 148 percent. Most of this increase came in the years between 1916 um, through 1919. It was principally caused by the widening of industrial opportunities due to the entrance of Northern workers into Marmy and to the demand for war workers at much higher wages than Negroes had been able to earn in the South. And so, so, so now you're being punished for, you know, continuing to be this with this nomad behavior, moving from place to place to find a better way to provide for you and your family. An added factor was the feeling, which was spread like a contagion um, throughout the South, that the great opportunity had come to escape from what they had felt to be the land of discrimination and some subserviency to places where they could expect a fair treatment and equal rights boy where they were on chicago became to southern negro the top of the world the effect of this influx of negroes into chicago's industry is reviewed in another section of this report it is necessary to report out here only that friction in the industry was less than it might have been that might have been expected. There had been few strikes which had given the Negro the name of strike breaker. But the demand for labor was such that there was plenty of jobs to absorb all um, the white and Negro workers available. This condition continued even after the end of the war and the 
demobilization. Now, in the housing, though, however, there was a different story. Practically no new building had been done in the city during the war, and it was a physical impossibility for a double Negro population to live in the space occupied in 1915. Negroes spread out of what had been known as the Black Belt into middle, I mean, into neighborhoods nearby which had been exclusively white. This movement, as described in another section of this report, developed friction so much that in the invaded neighborhoods, bombs were thrown at the houses of Negroes who had moved in and of the real estate men, white and Negro, who sold or rented property to the newcomers. From July 17th to July 27, 1990, the day the riots began, 24 such bombs had been thrown. The police had been entirely unsuccessful in finding those who were guilty and um, those who were accused of making the uh, 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 bombs little effort was put forth to do so. The third phase of the, site of the situation was in the increased political strength gained by Mayor Thompson's faction with the Republican Party. Negro politicians affiliated with this faction had been uh, able to sway to its support a large portion of the voters in the ward, mostly largely inhabited, inhabited by Negroes. Negro aldermen elected from this ward were prominent in the activities of this of faction. The part played by the Negro vote in the hard-fought partisan struggle is indicated by the fact that the Republican primary election on February 25th, 1919, Mayor Thompson received in this ward 12,143 votes, while his two opponents, Olson and Merriam, received only 1,492 and 319 respectively. Mayor Thompson was re-elected on April 1st, 1919 by a plurality of 21,622 in a total vote in the city of 698,920 people. His vote in this ward was 15,000 to his nearest opponent's 3,000 and was therefore large enough to control the election. The bitterness of this factual struggle aroused resentment against the race that had no suspicion, that had no conspicuously allied itself with the Thompson side. As part of the background of the Chicago riot, the activities of gangs and hoodlums should be cited. There had been friction for years, especially among the western boundary of the area in which Negroes mainly lived, and attacks upon Negro by gangs of young toughs had been particularly frequent in the spring just preceding the riot. Why they call them young uh, toughs instead of uh, white gangs? I just I mean, I, just, just a thought. Um, again, they reached the climax on the night of the June 21st, 1919, five weeks before the riot, when two Negroes were murdered. Each was alone at the time and was a victim of unprovoked and particularly brutal attack. Molestation of Negroes by hoodlums had been prevalent in the vicinity of parks and playgrounds and at the bays and beaches. On two occasions, shortly before the riot, 
the forewarnings of serious racial trouble had been so pronounced that the chief of police sent several hundred extra policemen to the territory where the trouble seemed to emanate from. But serious violence did not break out until Sunday afternoon, July 27th, when the clash on the lake shore at 29th Street resulted in that drowning of that Negro boy. 